Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Welcome tonight. It's great to see so many people here, because I think it really demonstrates just how the level of interest in foreign affairs is large, especially since we're competing with Super Tuesday. And people are obviously quite passionate about the issues that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, in, uh, that they're complex, and they demand a serious discussion. And I think we join here in this conversation at a time that, to me, feels particularly unsettling, though I know, obviously, historically, we've had uh, far more dangerous and deadly times. Still, as we watch the Middle East in free fall, borders disappearing, state authority collapsing, massive death tolls, and an overwhelming refugee crisis, humanitarian disasters, really, I feel like our international order is quite tested. Um, and so I think um, it also, we are coming at a time on these issues when I would say our national discourse on foreign policy is often impassioned, but too often too hostile and too simplistic. And so with, in the spirit of this year's Open Exchange Initiative, we're going to focus tonight on the value of dialogue and of talking with people with whom you disagree. And certainly the three former diplomats that we have with us tonight have all had their share of those kinds of conversations in government. And we all disagree with each other. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My and, uh, the punchline, right? <laughs> And I'm sure you had those discussions also in the university as well, right, like those disagreements. But sometimes this interlocutor could have been a dictator with whom the US differed, or maybe it was a friend. Um, and unfortunately, and this pains me as a reporter, believe me, we are not going to be able to solve all those crises that I identified. Um, but I'm hoping that we can at least set as a goal, an achievable goal, that we can come away equipped with a new way of talking about these issues and maybe offer some suggestions to the next US president whoever he or she may be. So tonight, you're gonna, you all should have gotten your cards. Did you get your cards? So we're going to start integrating those questions in a little bit. So be thinking about what you want to ask. In the beginning, I'm going to have sort of a guided conversation here. Um, and first, I would like to just, you've got the, the longer bios, but of course, they need no introduction. But let me just read a short inter introduction immediately to my left, Condoleezza Rice, is the Denning Professor in Global Business and Economy at the Graduate School of Business. The Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the Hoover Institution and a Professor of Political Science. From 2005 to 2009, Condi served as Secretary of State and before that, of course, as uh, President George W. Bush's National Security Advisor. She was Stanford's Provost here from 93 to 99. And before that, uh, President George H. W. Bush's uh, Chief Soviet Affairs Advisor on the National Security Council. Michael McFall, a Professor of Political Science and Director and Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Michael served for five years in the Obama administration, first as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russian and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council, and then as U.S. Ambassador to Russia from 2012 to 2014. Jeremy Weinstein is a Professor of Political Science and a Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Between 2013 and 2015, Jeremy served as the deputy to the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, and before that, as the chief of staff at the U.S. mission to the U.N. And from 2009 to 11, he served as the director for development and democracy on the White House National Security Council staff. So in the spirit of open exchange, I want to start with a question, everyone, about dialogue. And as I mentioned in my intro, all of you have had to sit across the table from people with whom you deeply disagreed. Condi, I've seen you do this myself when we traveled, when I covered you in Egypt and elsewhere. Michael, as US ambassador to Russia, of course, you've had your share of run-ins with Vladimir Putin. And Jeremy at the UN, I can't imagine there was ever any dissent that you had to mediate there. But um, whether it was peacekeeping forces, commitments, or whatever. And I wondered if you could just start on a personal note, because um, so often these things can go immediately wonky. It's my tendency. But I want to start on a personal note about a particularly difficult moment where you had to use dialogue for diplomacy and where you think it worked or where you were disappointed it failed. Condi, do you want to start? Sure. Well, I uh, will, first of all, Janine, thanks for, for doing this and uh, for your long service in, in the press. Janine actually covered me when I was Secretary of State and um, always did it with a deep interest in the issues, not just in the, the moment of the day. Uh, so, I will give you the example of uh, dealing with someone that uh, Mike knows very well, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. Uh, Sergei and I were sort of natural debaters. And uh, when we were often in multilateral settings with the Europeans and others, 
it made others a bit nervous that we were natural debaters. They wanted to kind of calm us down. But in fact, I always found him a very good interlocutor because I knew where he stood. I believed he was a good diplomat on behalf of his country. And so I think we developed a, a relationship of respect. I wouldn't say necessarily trust, but I would say respect. And the one thing that um, I learned about Sergei is if you were willing to actually listen closely, sometimes there were cues as to where you might have an interest intersection because what you're looking for in diplomacy is places that your interests intersect. You're looking for that one little overlap that might seem, uh, it might seem that your interests are this far apart, but you're looking for that one little place that it overlaps. And I remember we were discussing the Iranian situation and uh, we were talking about the Iranian nuclear program. And the Russians had been building a nuclear reactor in Iran called Bushir. And uh, we had the idea that, uh, the United States had the idea that the Iranians would be, we would be better off if the Iranians got their fuel from someone else or perhaps their, the fuel was, uh, was reprocessed in Iran but taken back to another country. And, and uh, Sergei said, well, that's exactly what we're proposing to do. But you've been against our reactor and you're always speaking out against our reactor. And I said, Sergey, are you saying that if we supported that reactor, you might be willing to go along with what I'm, and he said, well, yes. I don't think he really expected me to then deliver on the deal, but, uh, but I did. And for me, that was just an example that if you listen to the other person, uh, we have a tendency as Americans to always talk first and listen less. And I found in diplomacy that just listening for that moment of overlap was extremely important uh, to dialogue. Michael? So do you really, we already talked about Russia, but that's the case I know the best. Um, <laughs> I'll let, say. I'll have two cases then, all right? Russia and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and they're both disappointments, not instances of success. Because sometimes you can negotiate and listen and, and not achieve an outcome, and I think that's an important thing to understand about diplomacy. For me, without question, the greatest disappointment in diplomacy was our engagement with first Medvedev, President Medvedev, and then President Putin on Arab Spring, Syria, and ultimately uh, demonstrations in Russia. And what happened was, it was very, two very different kinds of conversations. With President Medvedev, and I want to be clear about this, the interlocutor in these meetings is President Obama. I'm with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get to the other one where I was across the table from a dictator and felt really bad about it. Uh, <laughs> actually, I felt bad about being across the table from Putin from time to time, too. <laughs> um, but, but what we learned, to make a long story short, is that Medvedev actually had a different theory of, of the world than Putin did. When we talked about the Arab Spring in the spring of 2011 with Medvedev, he said to our interlocutors, the president uh, and the vice president in particular, two meetings I remember vividly, uh, these regimes have to change. Uh, we understand that they can't last forever to what they've been doing. Uh, that was interesting. I mean, to listen to him and to listen back, we heard glimpses that we might be able to cooperate. And dramatically, we did cooperate for a while. Uh, most uh, memorably, we got two Security Council resolutions about Libya through, they abstained, but that was a vote that they were with us on that. Um, several months later, we went back to Russia. Actually, it was Los Cabos, of all weird places, to meet Putin. Uh, he was 45 minutes late, by the way, to the meeting with the president. And um, we had a big discussion about regime change and opposition mobilization. And it went on for about two hours, actually, uh, mostly about Syria, but not only, uh, also about Russia. And the president said, look, he likes that word, by the way, look, um, we didn't start any of this. These are people in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, and in your own country mobilizing because they want a different world. Now, we have a choice, Vladimir. I think he called him Vladimir. Uh, whether we just sit back and let this become revolutionary violent change, or do we try to get in front of it and edge it in a peaceful evolutionary change. That, that was Obama's theory about how do we react to these events. Putin had a different theory of international relations. 
Uh, Putin has a theory that the United States uh, goes around the world using covert and overt power to overthrow regimes we don't like. By the way, there's a lot of empirical data to support that hypothesis about <laughs> American foreign policy. Uh, if you look at it over the course of 70 years, 100 years, come take my course, we talk about it. Um, but when the president in a very point, pointed moment said, we're not seeking to overthrow your regime, Mr. President. And I was an ambassador at the time. Uh, and you know, Mike here was not sent by me to foment regime change against you. Putin never believed that, by the way. And he about never believed you. Be uh, well, oh. <laughs> but he wouldn't. We, no matter how much we argued about Syria or Russia, we never came to an, an agreement about how to deal with those problems. And so, uh, Obama's a really good listener. And yet on this particular issue, and Syria is the most uh, troubling to me because of the disaster there that was a consequence of it, uh, we could not come to an agreement about how to move forward. Last smaller story. There was a guy named President Bakiev in Kyrgyzstan. You've never heard of him. Uh, but he was a real thuggish dictator. Maybe you dealt with him, Kavi. Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. So right before I joined the government, you know, as an academic here, I wrote an article called The False Promise of autocratic stability, where I went through history and talked about different uh, dictators that were allies of the United States in the short run, but in the long run turned out to be not very good partners for us. And about a year after I published that, I found myself in Bishkek, sitting across the table from President Bakia, begging him to keep open our air base there, Manaz Air Base, which you know well. eating goat's eyes, by the way, in the process. That was part of the tradition you had to do to show respect. Um, and it felt horrible. It, the goats, <laughs> I don't recommend the eyes. That, that didn't taste that well either. But I was there just contradicting what, what I had just written a year before and, not, and feeling like, well, this is our policy, right? I, I didn't get to make the policy. My job was to be the diplomat to implement it. Uh, and it, it, it left me with this terrible feeling because, um, you know, I was doing exactly the opposite of what I'd written about just a year ago. But that's part of negotiations because in the short run, we got what we wanted, a vital base to our operations in Afghanistan. And at the end of the day, that trade-off was, was an important one for us because at the end of the day, we had made a determination, which I supported at the time, that we needed that in the short run <laughs> Uh, and part of doing diplomacy sometimes is sitting down with bad guys and eating eyes of goats in the name of the national interest. <laughs> Jeremy, did you ever have to eat eyes of goats? I was going to say, no goat eyes at the UN, although okay. a variety of dishes, of course. I wanted to also give uh, two examples on this front. One uh, more successful and one uh, you know, where we ran into, into some struggles. Let me start with the success. And here... While both have talked about the importance of listening, I want to underscore the importance of pressing and pressing in respectful and, and sort of responsible ways. I'm going to take an issue that, you know, we worked Iran, we worked Syria, we worked this range of issues at the United Nations, but I want to surface something that doesn't get much of the headlines, which is the push for the rights of LGBT peoples around the world. One of the reasons that we have the UN system and a set of charters and treaties and, and the body of the General Assembly to surface the challenges that we face around the world is so we can push to expand the normative commitments around human rights, uh, civil liberties, and political liberties. And although our coming to terms with LGBT rights as a country is something that has taken a very long time, I think the President's view over the course of this administration was just because it took us a long time in the United States doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking for ways to advance LGBT rights around the world and to push back against the violence and repression that LGBT people are focusing, uh, are, are sort of on the receiving end of in countries around the globe. This is a tough issue, right? A hugely tough issue, not only for our own domestic politics, but you can imagine for the politics of countries around the world especially in the African region where I'm a scholarly expert, uh, where you have laws on the books banning homosexual acts and uh, you know, holding people accountable with the death penalty in many places. 
Uh, but the president went to the United Nations in 2011, was the first head of state to declare a right of people to love whoever they want uh, in a speech to the UN. And we began to look for these little bureaucratic ways. These are the things that one really celebrates inside government when you can make progress to get the UN Human Rights Council to pass a first resolution on LGBT rights, to get a regular report to the UN Human Rights Council about attacks on LGBT people around the world, to have the first ever Security Council meeting on the threat uh, posed by ISIL to LGBT communities in Iraq and Syria, which was something that happened last August. But it was a very micro example of this sort of debate where the diplomacy really came to the fore. We had been pushing since the moment that Samantha Power and I arrived in New York to get the UN to treat its same-sex couples with the same benefits as any other couple in the UN system. Why? This is the UN. It's our highest expression of our aspirations uh, in terms of human rights around the world. And Ban Ki-moon, realizing that this was going to bring about tremendous pressure on him, made the very courageous decision to move forward and set in place a new policy. But Mike's friend, the Russians, uh, came back at us about six months after this policy was in place and began to mobilize the General Assembly to strip these new provisions, to strip these new benefits that had been provided to same-sex couples around the world. And in some sense, we thought from the outset that we were going to be destroyed on this front, right? That given the anti-LGBT sentiment uh, around the world, that there was no chance that we were going to be able to preserve this very important achievement that we had uh, obtained in the UN system. And so what we did was draw on the personal relationships of our entire foreign policy apparatus, from our ambassadors to our assistant secretaries at the State Department, to our teams inside New York, and mobilized a, a diplomatic campaign uh, with every country in the world to minimize the number of votes that the Russians could actually organize to strip this provision that Ban Ki-moon uh, uh, had so courageously put in place. And what was central, I think, was that we were guided by principle, but that we recognized the complexity of this decision for each of the countries that we were engaging. And in some cases, we needed to give them reasons to be for our view, even if they couldn't embrace wholeheartedly the notion of protecting the human rights of LGBT people. So for example, one thing that gave many of the diplomats who may have been quietly aligned with us but knew that this was difficult for their own governments, a safe space to go, was the importance of preserving the authority of the Secretary General, something that many countries out around the world care a great deal about. Uh, because they're interested in ensuring that the Secretary General has some autonomy uh, from the P5. And so you have to find the arguments that work, but importantly, you had to draw on the personal relationships. Uh, this couldn't have been a cold call. It was a very difficult call to make, uh, and we had to put it in context for people, but ultimately, we managed to hold the Russians off and sustain something that I think is a really important part of this administration's commitment to promoting LGBT rights around the world. The second thing I want to say, and I'll just say it super quickly, which is that Janine started with, with disagreements that we might have with adversaries and dictators. Often our toughest disagreements are inside the U.S. government. Uh, and I think uh, you know, that's an important thing that I think you know, both Condi and Mike can speak to. You've got a ton of well-meaning people around the table uh, with tremendous uncertainty about the likely returns on any policy option. Uh, and, you know, Mike and I experienced this, I think, a lot between 2009 and 2011 in particular as we grappled with the instability unleashed by the Arab Spring. Uh, but finding ways to disagree respectfully, finding ways to hear the viewpoints of others, to challenge them, to think about what kinds of empirical evidence you can bring to the table, what kinds of lived experience you can bring to the table, putting yourself in the shoes of different agencies that have a seat at the decision-making table, whether it's the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Department of Defense or our intelligence community. These are all entirely different perspectives on the set of issues that we have to confront around the decision-making table. And the best way that one wants to be remembered coming out of government is someone who fought hard for the set of beliefs that you have about the right policy, but ultimately someone who was respected by everyone in that contest and in that battle. And I think not everyone achieves that coming out of government, but disagreeing inside government and figuring out how to do it effectively, uh, I think is one of the keys to making our foreign policy process work. 
And I want to come back to those internal deliberations, because obviously you all have a lot to say about that. And I know, Jeremy, you've got some interesting ideas about how universities like Stanford can make those kinds of deliberations more constructive. But I want to pick up on what you said about, really, you were talking there a bit about empathy, I think, in, in, in terms of well, what happens putting yourself in someone else's shoes? What happens when empathy bucks up against national interests or perhaps politics? And what I want to talk about is the refugee crisis that we're witnessing right now that um, for many in this room, it will be the, the greatest in your lifetimes. Um, this is, uh, I mean, I don't know how to call this anything but an epic fail of the international community. Maybe you want to disagree with me on this, and I think it relates to Syria, which we'll talk about. Syria and the Middle East, obviously, but when it comes to the refugee crisis, and maybe there's some parallel in how we talk about <clears throat> immigration in this country, um, how do we talk about this? How do we resolve it? It touches, I mean, Russia, obviously. I mean, this is one where I think we have to do a little bit about the policy, but I'm also interested in how we talk about the refugees, and can we find a way to talk about it in a more constructive way? I don't know who wants to talk about this first, maybe. Thanks. <laughs> Look, once a refugee crisis has gotten to this magnitude, it is extremely difficult to resolve. And I don't think we get anywhere by vilifying people on different sides of how to resolve it. This is a hard issue. I think Angela Merkel, for whom I have enormous respect, I think she's one of the great leaders, she did the right thing from the point of view of empathy, and I think from the point of view of her beliefs about Germany's historical responsibility given Germany's past. But it was done without really an understanding of how they were gonna manage the problem. And systems do get overwhelmed. I ran refugee <coughs> policy as Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is in charge of refugee policy for the United States. The United States is the most generous uh, recipient of refugees in the world. We always take more refugees uh, than most places in the world, than any place in the world, on a systematic basis. The only report that the Secretary of State has to give to the Congress in person is the report on refugee numbers that we're going to receive every year. And we have some wonderful congressional uh, supporters of refugee policy. Ted Kennedy was a lion in this regard. Uh, Zoe Lundgren from right down uh, the street here, a, li a lioness in, in this regard. But I would go and I would report how many refugees are we gonna take worldwide? The largest number we ever took worldwide in my four years as secretary was 7,500, worldwide. And that's because our system of refugee settlement is not one that leaves people in camps for an extended period of time. Janine, you and I have seen some of the worst refugee camps in the world. And just leaving people in refugee camps is really one of the saddest existences you can imagine. So the United States has had a policy of relocating people into communities. It relies on an infrastructure of non-governmental organizations, often faith-based institutions, often cultural institutions that will take people. I, one of the first jobs I had when I came back from studying Russian language in the Soviet Union was helping Russian emigres relocate in Denver because Denver had a very active Jewish community center and it would take these families, it would for two years help people get jobs, help people get language training, help the kids in school, help them deal with medical problems. My vocabulary about medical problems in Russian is endless because that's what I helped people with most of the time. And then they would be relocated into the community. That's how our system works. It's not possible to suddenly take a huge infusion of refugees and make that system work. And so I thought the problem with saying, we're gonna take 10,000 more refugees, which I would support just on humanitarian grounds, is to imply that we could do it within the current system. Rather say, we're going to do that, but here are some of the ways we're going to have to look differently at how we receive refugees. Because the truth of the matter is, after Paris, after Cologne, people were scared. And you can't simply say, don't be scared. You have to say, here's why you shouldn't be scared. Here's what we're doing to make sure that people are properly vetted. Here's what we're doing to relocate people. So I think the refugee issue is a very hard one. It doesn't help to vilify people on different sides of it. And once it got to this level, 
we have an almost irresolvable problem. It should never have gotten to this level. We really need to find a way, even today, for refugees or for Syrians to feel safe in their country or in places like Jordan or Turkey or other places, I have favored a safe zone for them, a no-fly zone for them, so that they can stay in place. Because large numbers of migrants on the move easily overwhelm systems, and you simply can't ignore that fact. Even though I'm a very firm believer that the United States has a moral obligation to take people, Let's remember that we have to have a way to take them that is actually going to work within our system. We can't do more than 10,000, Condi? As I said, Janine, not the way that we relocate refugees. We relocate refugees in communities. We use faith-based and non-governmental institutions. We don't have a large U.S. government refugee apparatus. We don't. So if you want to keep the system, which I do think works, maybe you could have uh, a, a, maybe you could give more resources to larger number of NGOs and faith-based people and try to, uh, to mobilize our system, but you'd have to do that. You can't just overwhelm the system that's there. Jeremy Condi says the system works. Does it work? First of all, Condi is absolutely right that the Refugee Resettlement Program is one of the most extraordinary contributions that the United mm -hmm. States has made historically. It was founded you know, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, we were resettling up to 200,000 people a year through that program. Uh, then after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the early 1990s, it was about 100,000 yeah. uh, per year, 125,000. And then it has shrunk over time. Yeah. Uh, and that means that grappling with a refugee crisis of absolutely historic proportions is difficult to do with the architecture uh, that we have. And I lived these debates inside uh, the West Wing uh, over the summer before the refugee crisis had really taken off when we were trying to figure out what the refugee quotas would be and how to address the needs in particular of the Syrian refugees. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that our politics make addressing this. So we have a bureaucratic challenge and then we have a political challenge. The political challenge is that the refugee architecture that we've built depends on congressional funding. Uh, and what that means is that growing the account, the resources that we use to support refugee resettlement uh, in the United States, means getting support from Congress to do so. Uh, and in the absence of that, you're forced into the kinds of extraordinary trade-offs that I'm sure Condi had to face on a regular basis where you're choosing between one need and another need with very limited funds on the table. And in the case of refugee resettlement, that means resettling one family in the United States or financing hundreds of people living in a refugee camp in Kenya or in Chad or wherever it might be because it's all coming from the same pool of funds. For me, the big takeaway is this is a moment where we have to take a fresh look at our refugee resettlement architecture. The problem that we have is not going away. Uh, the problem that we have is going to be with us for decades, and we have a humanitarian architecture that simply isn't up to the task. Uh, but we're going to need a bipartisan consensus about how to do that. But Jeremy, I actually think, just to follow up on this, I, I actually think you could get that consensus. But you have to start with the line that you uttered. We need to rethink the architecture. The architecture as it exists now can't handle what we're looking at. And so I think if you start with the, the premise that we all want to resettle people because the, I was actually, Angelina Jolie is actually the UN um, refugee um, ambassador and she is amazing in that role. I mean, she knows the issues, she works hard at it. She's not one of those celebrities who just kind of shows up once in a while. She really works the issue. It's the saddest thing in the world to be to see refugees. Uh, they are stateless people. Uh, they are often, uh, you lose whole generations of people. One of the saddest places I was ever was the Darfur refugee camps outside of Sudan, where women who simply went to get water <coughs> would be raped sometimes by UN peacekeepers. Refugee life is very, very sad. 
So you want to be able to relocate people in ways that they can continue their lives, but it does require a rethinking of our architecture. 75,000 plus 10,000 more, we couldn't take it. And so I think the conversation had to start, let's figure out how to, re, uh, to, to reform our architecture to make it more responsive to the current problem. Michael, a few thoughts? Just a couple of thoughts. Um, it's not just the, the, I want to add another political dimension, which is, let, I, I agree both. We need, to, we need to reform the architecture of our refugee program and then sell it to Capitol Hill. Uh, we also have to have a, a more empirically based conversation about the nature of the threat that comes with this, right? So I think 10,000 is a pathetic number compared to the other countries there. And I also agree with my colleagues who know more, to do more than that requires a new system. And we also have to talk about the threat that comes from expanding that, because let's be honest, the debate we're having right now has nothing to do with the facts. I, I'm not an expert on terrorism, right? So I use this thing called Google, I looked it up. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm gonna cite a Harvard colleague of ours that says the, the annual risk of an American of being killed by a terrorist right now is one in 3.5 million. Now that's, the, more, Americans are more likely to die of an accident in a bathtub, three times more likely to die in a bathtub, or by a deer, or by um, a home appliance, or by lightning. But nobody's talking that way. We don't talk that way. We all talk about the one time and the, and the, the, the that's going to come in because our system doesn't work. So, and that's unpopular to say those kinds of things. And and I understand the one time is tragic, but we're not having a rational debate about this, in my opinion. And that's our fault, by the way. You know, it's our fault as well as the candidate's fault, in my opinion. We need to fill that debate with empirical facts and not just watch it, uh, you know, the, the, the debate on TV. It's also the Obama administration's fault, in my opinion, uh, that did not make the case, that did not make the argument, put that number out there, and then backed away for reasons, I don't know, you, you were there long, uh, uh, more recently than I was, Jeremy, but I, I saw that big number and then I saw no follow through. And I would say, you know, thinking retrospectively on some of the other rollouts we did when I was in the government, that's one of our problems. Um, um, and then the, the last thing I would say is, well, let's go on. I, yeah, I, I, don't want, I was about to get into immigration. Again, let's leave you, that for later. Okay, we'll come back to it. We can spend a the lot wall. of time on each of these, but Fundamentally, you know, Condi's right. We, if we could get the people to stay in country or stay in, it'd be easier than absorbing 11 million displaced people from Syria alone, never mind everybody who's coming from North Africa. Afghanistan or... <coughs> Which leads to a Syria question, but I want to come at it from the Russia angle because this is becoming really, I mean, they're talking about a new Cold War and we're really, are we, is it hyperbolic to say one down U.S. jet away from some kind of real war? I mean, it's, we're getting close with Turkey flying and Russia flying in the same airspace, and I don't want to go too into the policy like I said, but the refugee issue is related to this. Michael, you were trying to do the reset with the Russians. Are we, is the next president, whoever she or he may be, I say again, um, going to have to reset again? I mean, or can we talk to the Russians? I mean, this is a conversation about dialogue. We're not doing a great job talking to the Russians right now. They are dictating policy in Syria, as far as I can tell. So I remember the last thing I want to say, and I want to say it, which is don't just wait for the government to help Syrian refugees. Uh, we just had the Deputy Secretary of State out here, uh, Tony Blinken, uh, who came with a plea to Silicon Valley to say, help us educate those kids in those camps. And everyone here, you can do that. You don't have to wait for this, we need to rethink our refugee policy. Yes, we do. But you don't have to wait if you want to get engaged. Email me or tweet, uh, tweet at me, at McFall, and I'll help you get engaged, okay? That's what I wanted to say. Because you don't have to wait. You can do something about that right now, right tonight. Oh, I think tonight, it's important, though, because I want to be, you want to do something besides post yeah. on Facebook, right? Yeah. You want to be able to do something. Yeah. You can, you can help, agenda, and they, the government's yeah. looking for help. They, mm. The government came to us looking okay. for help. You all can be part of the solution if you want to be. Russia, uh, Syria. Uh, we can't solve that. the whole thing, so yeah. we just. You know. mm -hmm. Well, just two things on the reset and then the specifics yeah. of Syria. So the reset, if, to remind you all, when, when we came into government in January 2009, uh, when I came into government, I shouldn't say we, um, uh, you left and we came that's in. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so it was my policy you were resetting. That's <laughs> Want to explain that? Yeah. 
exchange. We, or... we look for continuity too, Condi, just so you know. Uh, in fact, I would, if we had longer, I think there was a lot more continuity there because in terms of engagement, it wasn't like these folks were not engaged. We were engaged. We went to Moscow, I think, more than anywhere else, yeah, frankly. Yeah, other okay. than Israel. Mm -hmm. And the Which Palestinian, we'll get to next, Palestinian territories in Israel, 24 times. Okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> but, but because it's about exchange, I want to talk about it a little bit. So the reset was a policy based on what, what Condi said earlier in her dialogues with Sergei Lavrov, which is we're new, let's use the moment to find ways to engage with the Russians and at the highest levels because things were pretty broken at, at other levels, uh, to look for what the president called win-win outcomes, right? It was good for Russia, good for the United States. There was no, uh, eventually it, 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 it kind of, uh, we lost control of this. I lost control of this. It was not about making friends with the Russians. I want to make that clear. It wasn't about, you know, we need to like, correct the wrongs from this previous period. It was about very, Cold-headed, do, do the Russians have an interest in the Iranians getting a nuclear weapon? Our answer was no. Let's work with them to prevent that. By the way, a lot of continuity, the P5 plus one and sanctions, continuity with the Bush administration. Uh, do the Russians have an interest in, in the Taliban and Al-Qaeda winning in uh, Afghanistan? Our answer was no. Let's find out a way to cooperate with them. Do we have an interest in doing more trade? Uh, having more investment between our two uh, countries? Our answer was yes, and let's look for a way to engage on them. And during the period in, you know, from 2009 to 2011, we got a lot of those things done. We got a lot, you know, we got a START treaty done, we got them into the WTO, we got a new round of sanctions, and I could go on and on uh, in terms of achievements. Um, and then things changed. And that's an important thing about engagement and dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, two big things changed. And one I already mentioned, there was this election, it was falsified, uh, about at the same rate that most elections in post-communist Russia had been falsified, by the way. We thought it was no big deal. We, I was still working at the White House at the time. But a bunch of crazy young people in Russia actually wanted to make a big deal out of it. And they documented it with their phones and, and went on Twitter and Vukontakti and Facebook. And then demonstrated in the largest demonstrations that had been in Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Putin, therefore, reacted to that. He needed us as an enemy. He wanted to blame these people to say they were our, uh, you know, marionettes, our puppets. And then when I got to be ambassador uh, a couple months later, uh, you know, my puppets. Um, and slowly over that period of time, it was clear to me we were not going to be able to cooperate. And I was one of those that said, stop trying to cooperate. That's important. Stop trying to cooperate on arms control or missile defense or even, dare I say, Syria. I think one of our mistakes in 2011, 2012 is we chased the Russians too long, looking for a Security Council resolution to try to do that with them okay. when it was clear to me that they weren't going to do that. So that's a long way of saying. And then Russia, Putin, uh, and his regime annexed Ukraine and then, you know, started this proxy war. Uh, in eastern Ukraine. So to me, until he changes those policies, it would be bad policy to start a new reset. I'm the author of the reset. I don't believe in a second reset. Yeah. Okay. Having said all that, I want to say two other things. And yet, Let's, in the margins, you can we got, we got, I got like a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I, wanna, yeah. I just want to talk about this one. Because <laughs> yeah. I know those are going to be harder questions. But even in that, you can, oh, I'm throwing softballs. You yeah. can cooperate on Iran. You can cooperate on the chemical weapons. In other words, it's not black and white and on specific issues, just like Secretary Kerry is trying mm -hmm. to do right now with the Russians, we can, we can seek to cooperate, but also agree that we're not gonna have a kind of fundamental new relationship with Russia until Putin changes his policy. Can I just make Kanye. one, one, one forward-looking point? I, I agree that this is, yeah, this is not the time to uh, try and engage the Russians. And by the way, you did have a new president in Medvedev, and I, I don't think you were wrong to try to, to make it work with Medvedev. The problem was, Medvedev was never very powerful. It was always about Vladimir Putin, and that was the problem. But I think the challenge is actually to uh, recognize that we don't really have much to say to the Putin regime right now without isolating Russians. I'm very concerned that the period between the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of Vladimir Putin produced a different kind of Russian citizen. <coughs> many of them young, many of them travel, many of them outward looking. 
They are in our graduate schools of business. They're in our law firms. They are in our communities, uh, venture capitalist communities. And I would really hate to see the isolation of Vladimir Putin become the isolation of, the, of Russians, particularly young Russians. And so you've asked, what can the university do? I've said to universities, keep inviting Russian students to be a part of us. Keep reaching out to Russian scholars. Keep reaching out to Russian liberals to bring them among us because one day, Vladimir Putin and his oil syndicate are gonna fall from power. One day, the fact that they are 80% dependent on oil, gas, and minerals for exports is going to crash that economy. And when it changes, you want to have that layer of a different kind of Russian population that is comfortable in the West, that is comfortable with liberal values, that does want many of the things we have. And so finding ways to continue to engage the Russian people, even if you isolate the regime, I think is extremely important. And most of that's gonna to have to be done by what we call civil society, the business community, the faith-based communities, the universities, uh, and the like. And I totally agree with Kavi on that. So, Condi, you, just to, to, there's questions about how this really compares to the Cold War era, actually, yeah. to get some perspective. I mean, because it looks pretty bad, right? I mean, no. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's bad, but it's not the Cold War. Uh, for one thing, this was, the Cold War was a clash of systems. Was the Soviet Union believing that it had an answer to how human history ought to unfold that was a counter to the American and Western view of how history ought to unfold? And you know how you can tell when somebody has a view? They try to make little uh, replicas of themselves around the world. So in Czechoslovakia or in Romania or in Poland, you had little Soviet communist parties everywhere. And so it was a system. And we had very little with which we cooperated with the Soviet Union, except we didn't want to annihilate each other. So the only thing was about nuclear weapons. Everywhere else, it, only uh, during, during the Cold War, no more than 1% of Soviet GDP was ever accounted for by international trade. It was completely isolated from the international system. And so this isn't a clash of systems. This isn't a clash of ideologies. Um, I'm old enough to remember when the, Russian, when the Soviet hockey team was defeated by the United States am uh, amateur hockey team. It was like we defeated communism. You know, this was a very different, had a different. What you have now is an international system based largely on uh, liberal economics, of which, by the way, China is an important part, and a Russia that isn't quite capable of competing in that system, and so it's sort of chomping at the heels of that system and making trouble, but I don't think it would be fair to think of it um, as a Cold War. I think there are still some common interests that we can pursue in ways that we never could with the Soviet Union. Jeremy, you had a thought on this? Just, just one thing I wanted to add to this conversation. Uh, you know, from the perspective of the Security Council where not only are you engaging the Russians literally every day on every issue, you know, as a permanent member of the Council, but you also got to find a lot of things to cooperate yeah. on. Uh, you know, 60% plus of the business of the Security Council is African-related conflicts. Um, and, and Russia still has an interest, uh, despite some of our disagreements, in being seen as a constructive participant in some aspects of the international system. And, and we were always in New York looking for ways to identify those arenas where we could work together. But the second thing that I was gonna say, and I think it builds very much on, on Condi's last point, you know, things are tough with Russia, they're tough with China, and we may come to China as well. Um, and people often look at the international order that we've built since 1945 and say, this international order is struggling to deal with the new challenges of this day and age. But if there's anything that's causing people to double down on the international order that we've constructed, it's concern about Russia's annexation right. of Crimea that's right. and invasion of the territorial integrity of the country of Ukraine. It's China's behavior in the South China Sea. And so these are things that at this day and age when we are still struggling you know, to make the Security Council a functioning body, to make sure that the UN and other multilateral mechanisms are vehicles for peacefully resolving challenges, we could go to the General Assembly and have 100 countries vote with us to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. When Russia invaded Georgia, we got 13 countries to vote with us. 
This is a dramatic shift, and I think it reflects a continuing investment as power is changing in the world in the set of rules and standards and institutions that we have constructed so diligently since 1945. And the next president, you know, Democratic or Republican, needs to see that desire from our allies, from partners around the world for doubling down on the system and figuring out how to use this system to constrain some of the expansionist and most dangerous tendencies of our adversaries. There's a couple questions here about Syria, but it, I think it relates to Russia. One questioner wants to know about ground troops in Syria, and I want to relate it to this Russia discussion, because right now it's good that we can play the long game and cultivate people uh, who to be on our side in the long run, but the Russians are bombing <coughs> rebels that we are yeah. equipping. Yeah, and it's too late, so, Janine. So tactically, we it, have to deal with that. Yeah, if we're ever going to forget a ground invasion, I mean, we can, you know. Sometimes when you don't make a decision, you've made a decision. And the decision three or so years ago not to arm the rebels, the decision three or so years ago not to use serious American air power in support of those rebels meant that there was a vacuum, and Russia has now filled that vacuum. They have succeeded, at least for the time being, in stabilizing the Assad regime. They can now call for a ceasefire because they own the facts on the ground along with the Iranians, and they can now dictate the peace. And that peace will, for the time being, have Assad as a part of it. And that will be a tragedy for the people of Syria. But I don't see now a way that we get back in the game in Syria in a serious way. We might be able to do something about the refugees through mm -hmm. cooperation with Jordan and the Turks and others. But in terms of how the politics of Syria will unfold now, the Russians understand something. Diplomacy follows the uh, the, as they would put it, correlation of forces on the ground, not the other way around. And they created facts on the ground, and they can now reap the benefit of those facts of the ground at the diplomatic table. Now, eventually, you know, Vladimir Putin is not a sentimental man. And when uh, Assad is worth nothing to him, he will, over, he will throw Assad aside. But, you know, all of those people who were saying, well, he's going to be in a quagmire in Syria, and they'll never succeed in Syria, well, actually, all he wanted to do was strengthen Assad in his, his strongholds so that he had an argument that Assad was the president of Syria. He's got that argument, and I think we have no way to change those facts. I just add, I mean, the, you know, the critical, this has been a policy that has struggled, you know, around a fundamental mismatch between the ends that, that we're seeking and the means that we're willing to deploy. And there have been multiple steps at which that gulf I think is visible. Uh, but fundamentally, in August 2011, when the decision was made uh, to say publicly that Assad had lost the legitimacy to lead, that was the moment at which ISIL didn't exist you know, in, in both Iraq and Syria. It was a moment at which the democratic protests that had uh, sort of been organized around Syria were led by doctors and teachers and farmers, where there was a domestic mobilization uh, uh, you know, to, to deal with the inequities and the fundamental repression of the Assad regime. And the challenge was that by, not, by, by choosing that policy direction but not taking ownership of the set of steps that might be required to bring it about, and there are lots of reasons that, that I think ultimately the president and others didn't want to go down that path that we can discuss, but it was an invitation to the rest of the world uh, to begin to play games in that environment as well. Uh, and ultimately, the challenge that the Russians face, they've succeeded in many ways in strengthening the hands of the Assad regime, and, and that gives them leverage at the diplomatic table. Uh, but the idea of putting Assad back in charge of the rest of Syria isn't practical either, right? And so yeah. what their outcome is, what their end game is, what costs they're willing to bear, we still don't know. Yeah, Jeremy, I can, I can give you an idea. They don't mind frozen conflicts. Exactly. They don't right. mind countries that basically don't function, Ukraine. So you have eastern Ukraine that doesn't function, Crimea that doesn't function, and Kiev that also doesn't function. You have Abkhazia and Ossetia hived off from Georgia that don't function. You have Transnistria, which doesn't function. You have Chechnya, which kind of doesn't function. And so I think from the point of view of Putin, as long as you can call it uh, you can say that your guy is in charge. It doesn't matter if the country doesn't function. 
And that's, I think, been our mistake, to assume that Putin has the same definition of success in Syria that we do. And I think a stable, functioning Syria was never his definition of success. You know, I agree. It, it's a, are you guys? I spoke a lot on Russia later, so I'm, I agree. <laughs> oh, that's all I'll say. Condi, are you saying that we have yielded the end game to the Russians in Syria? There is nothing yes. we can do? I think we we're playing no, no, defense. No, no. We're playing defense. There's well, no end game. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point. Not yeah. that we've yielded right. the end game. This is so. This is this is an observation as the noodle head from Stanford goes to to Washington, and I come back. What did I learn? We are all engineers. We Americans. Well, you know, we're, there's a problem, it needs to be solved, right? That's, that's how we think. And by the way, I really admire that about our diplomacy and our country, by the way. It's the way we look at problems. Russians, and Mr. Putin in particular, doesn't look at it that way. He doesn't look at, at Syria as a problem to solve. His main mission was to not let his guy fall. And by the way, the reason he intervened, because w remember that conversation I was talking about in Los Cabos, and we said, if you, if you just prop up this guy, there's going to be more violence there. There's going to be more radicals there. Assad will stimulate them. That's exactly what happened, by the way. Our analysis was correct. And that's why he had to intervene to not, I mean, Assad was in big trouble yeah. six months ago. But, but to have an end game, he's perfectly happened. Let ISIS be here, Assad here. We'll talk for a long time about peace and stability. But he, he can live comfortably with those kinds of n problems that are not solved. There's a couple of questions from students here about Iraq and ISIS, and um, let's talk about, we talked about people not being able to assess risk, but this is another set of problems that have emerged, some would argue, from a vacuum that was left in Iraq after the Iraq war. And so now we are faced with ISIS spreading across Syria and Iraq. Um, how do you all view this threat? And is this another area where we have lost agency? I don't think we've lost the agency on ISIS. And look, there is no doubt that the, there was a vacuum in Iraq. Uh, and the vacuum in Iraq was both because of the war and because of the withdrawal of American forces in 2011. Because in 2011, as President Obama himself said, Iraq was stable. I think that the Iraqis, the Kurds, the Shia, the Sunnis trusted us more than they trusted each other. And uh, when we left, they went at each other. But there was a vacuum. Syria then exploded, and those forces that had been pushed out of Iraq into Syria were able then to reoccupy the territory between Iraq and Syria. And now you have essentially an ungoverned territory between Iraq and Syria that ISIS operates within. Now, I do not think we've lost agency because I don't think we can do anything about Syria, but I do think we've got an opportunity with Iraqi forces, whether it's their special forces, which are not bad, the Kurds, the Peshmerga of the Kurds, the Sunni tribes, to actually support them with air power. And they've demonstrated that they can take back territory. They took Ramadi back. It will be tougher to take Mosul. But somebody has got to defeat ISIS in its crib. Uh, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, has said that the numbers of core fighters are somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000. One day that will be a lot more, but let's just say for now it's 40,000. They march in columns. Right? They, they don't hide in caves like Al Qaeda. They march in columns. They have command and control that is visible. They have something that they call a state. If CBS News can find them, the American military can find them. <laughs> and so going after them now with air power, the ground forces are the Iraqis and the the Peshmerga and others, we don't need a ground presence beyond advisors and special forces, probably not much beyond the numbers that we have now. But military people will tell you, we have to be willing to forward deploy our people with the Kurds, with the, the uh, Iraqis, and with others. Why do we have to defeat them? Three very important reasons. Number one, uh, I understand, Mike, that I might you know, slip in the bathtub, but the fact is, as long as they are inspiring lone wolves like San Bernardino, people are going to feel unsafe, and they're right to feel unsafe. And the way that you keep them from inspiring people is you defeat them. And once you defeat them, they won't inspire anybody. Secondly, they are destroying the fabric of the Middle East. 
by their, uh, their threats to the various states of the Middle East? And third, can we really in the 21st century tolerate a force in the center of the Middle East that rapes seven-year-old girls, that beheads people on social media, and that is destroying uh, the Christians in, in the Middle East? Can we really live with that in the 21st century as a civilized state? And I would say we can't. And so that's why they have to be defeated. I know they have tentacles in places like Libya and the like. But if you can defeat them in their core, which is that territory between Syria and Iraq, they will be less of a problem and will all sleep better. And I, I do think this is one that is within, the, uh, within our grasp, unlike Syria. You know, you're going to hear from all the candidates, on day one, I will. Well, let me tell you something. On day one, they won't. <laughs> because they have no idea what is going to happen when they walk into the Oval Office. But the person who says, on day one, I will ask the military for a comprehensive plan to destroy ISIS, that's, that I'm going to listen to. Jeremy? I agree with everything that Condi said uh, in terms of our agency and, in fact, the progress that we are making in our efforts to counter ISIL's expansion, taking territory back, standing up the Iraqi forces, you know, uh, sort of disrupting key financial networks. The list goes on and on. And I think, you know, despite what you hear out of Washington, there's actually quite a bit of bipartisan support for the sort of core elements of the counter-ISIL strategy. What's hardest, I think, is not going after a terrorist group that has taken space uh, in ungoverned spaces. What is hardest for us to figure out how to influence is a sectarian politics that is characteristic of Iraq, is characteristic of Syria, and now more broadly playing out in the region. At the root of the emergence of ISIL uh, was an inability in the post-Iraqi context, the post-war context, to figure out a bargain that could bring the Shia and the Sunni together in a centralized state. And we began to see progress between the Shia in Baghdad and the Kurds with respect to revenue sharing, with respect uh, to oil resources. But ultimately, the Sunnis have the short end of the stick, a part of the country without the same infrastructural investment, without the same natural resources. And ultimately, it's been a real challenge, I think, first with Maliki and now with Abadi, uh, to get the kinds of political reforms and policy reforms, whether it relates to the security sector, whether it relates to creating opportunities to work again in government, uh, which is a major employer uh, you know, in Iraq, uh, to figure out an Iraq as a central state uh, that can really be a place that treats people with respect and gives them opportunity regardless of their sectarian background. Uh, but but it's, it's very hard. And I look, it takes a long time for institutions to take hold in which people can do exactly what you said, which is make bargains between ethnic groups or tribes or confessional uh, sectarian groups. But really the only answer is ultimately they do have to have something that looks like democratic institutions or somebody is going to have to oppress somebody else and that's not stable. And so I'm willing to take a bet on the Iraqs of the world that if you give it time and nurture it, maybe people begin to start to use those institutions. And why do I say it takes time? Because, you know, I took an oath of office to a constitution as the 66th Secretary of State, a constitution that counted my ancestors as three-fifths of a man a couple centuries ago. So it takes time to make that kind of transition. I fear that we've lost faith in this process of giving people that chance. Uh, there was a really compelling uh, report by a group of Arab intellectuals in 2002 um, about the problems of the Middle East and how to think about the problems in the Arab world. And they said there were three gaps. They said there was a knowledge gap. And they cited extraordinary statistics about how many patents had been in Korea some 500 times more than in the entire Middle East in the same period of time, the knowledge gap. Secondly, they talked about the gap for women's rights, that you could not have decent societies in which women were treated as second-class citizens. And third, they talked about the freedom gap, that in the time when authoritarians in places like Egypt and authoritarians in places like, and dictators like people in, like Saddam in Iraq, 
were holding these places with an iron fist, what they were actually suppressing was healthy political forces. People that might have run for office, people that might have been in civil society. And what took its place? What was the most organized forces? It was the most radical Islamist forces like Hezbollah and Hamas. And so I think we have to keep our eye on the long term in the Middle East to address those three gaps, the knowledge gap, the gap for women's rights, and the gap for, for freedom. It, it isn't going to be pretty in the short term. But if we don't keep that long term vision in place, I don't think we'll ever solve this problem. So when Condi, when one student asks if forced, who asserts that forced democratization in the Middle East has empirically failed, you're saying take a longer view. I'm, so, I'm saying, first of all, you don't have to impose democracy. You impose tyranny. And anybody who thinks, I, I think when you think that those people don't actually want the same freedoms that we have, they don't want to be able to say what they think. They don't want to be able to worship as they please. They'd like to have the secret police knock on their houses, their doors at, in the middle of the night and take their husbands or, or sons away. Yeah, those people, no. They want the same liberties that we enjoy. And so you don't have to impose democracy. Now, if you say you can't, quote, impose democracy at bayonet point, I'm right there. That's absolutely true. But the idea that somehow the West is giving these people something that they otherwise would not want, I think is really pretty patronizing. We've got a lot of democracy experts here, so. Well, um, so we're four for 17 in terms of military interventions. What, 10 years after a military intervention, is there a democracy? We're four for 17. Go buy my book. It's called Advancing Democracy Abroad. <laughs> the data is there. Actually, we're four, four for 18 if you count Libya. It depends on how you code Libya, OK? Um, so that, that, that's, but that's not a very interesting conversation, right? I mean, that's, that's, that, this notion that, and by the way, although I'm sitting next to Secretary, now I'm going to call her Secretary Rice, not Condi. <laughs> um, I wrote in that book with, I think Panama is the only exception. I, this is a while ago I wrote this. Mm -hmm. But we never invade a country to, impo no. to promote never. democracy or advance democracy, never. including Iraq. Right. That is a bit of, and then we never leave because we're different going all the way back to uh, you know, uh, earlier interventions 100 years ago without trying. And that's just kind of the nature of, of how we do these kinds of things. So that's the first thing I think we should disaggregate that. Second, to underscore, the, the data shows what, what, now I'll call her Condi, because uh, she agreed with me. Uh, uh, the data showed what she said about uh, public attitudes around the world. That data is all available. You, you can get it. Uh, most people think. It's, it's uh, you know, a good thing to choose your leaders rather than have them appointed or, or come from God or have a religious leader. That, and the data's all there. That's, that's true, number two. But the third piece, the hard part, is the interaction between those people thinking that and our means for fighting for these other things. And here, here's where I'm, I'm a little, I'm nervous about our war against ISIS. Uh, it's called Operation Inherent Resolve, by the way. Go Google it and look up the numbers. Uh, if you want to track it, they, they, they update it every other day. Um, and here's what I would say so far about this operation. You were still in the government when it started, Jeremy, so maybe you want to add to this. But number one, it started too slowly. Uh, it took us a long time. Uh, I remember very vividly the fall of Mosul and you know, debate about you know, we, we, should, we should begin airstrikes, and we <coughs> began too slowly in my view. Um, but now we're in 11,000 strikes, folks, 11,000. Uh, you have spent, or the government has spent on your behalf, about $6 billion. And the, the public, when I go talk about these things in other places besides Stanford, they think, one, we're not doing anything, and two, it's been ineffective. Uh, and so I worry, I, I actually think we're making progress, like both of my colleagues said, uh, but I worry about uh, finishing the job. Uh, I'm not quite sure who does that. Uh, I don't think you're going to do it with air power alone. So who actually does that? Uh, and I'm worried about us, our country, wanting to be there for the long haul in terms of these kinds of engagements. I sense when I talk about these things in places like Montana 
uh, just because I was there recently. I'm from there, just so you know. People are like, that's not our problem. We want to protect the border, right? This is the, this is the argument here. Yeah. We want to protect the border, but what ISIS does over there, you know, why are, why are we involved? Mike, Mike, they may be saying that in Montana, but they're not saying it in Alabama, where I'm from. Okay, all right, all right. All right. So, all right. Uh, because, because I hear something very different. I hear contradictory thoughts, okay. in, and, and people can hold contradictory thoughts. One is, boy, we don't want anything to do with the Middle East because they need to solve their own problems and right. the sectarian and so forth. But boy, we cannot allow ISIS to do what it's doing. And every time somebody's beheaded or every time somebody's, you know, But they Christians, say, let's bomb more. That's what they say yeah, in Montana. Yeah. What do they say in Alabama? And, and Alabama, do they, they say just, send in, in the 82nd Airborne? No, but nobody wants to send in the 82nd but Airborne. But that's the problem. No, Mike, that isn't. What I said is that you could say to the military on day one, Give me a plan to defeat the 40,000 core fighters of ISIS. Not, not ISIS the tentacles, the 40,000 core fighters. And I think what you would get from the military, if you listen to people who now are talking as they've come out. Why do you think the president hasn't asked our friend Ash Carter for exactly what I plan? What I understand from people who have come out is that they give a coherent plan and it gets cherry picked. Uh, one from column A, one from column B, not let's do the whole thing because, for instance, the idea that we would forward deploy American forces with, uh, on raids, uh, on operations with the Iraqi forces or with the Kurds, people are afraid of casualties. So they don't want to do that. And, and if you don't forward deploy, if you don't have spotters for air power, you can have 11,000 times 11,000 raids air raids, and they won't be effective. And so I think if you asked for an effective way to deal with ISIS, you would get one. But then you have to, to do the whole package. Um, I, I actually think the American people, and I think Jeremy is right about this, there would be a lot of bipartisan support for defeating them. Otherwise, you let them sit there, metastasize, get bigger, and now it's 100,000 fighters. But I actually want to make the point that I think Jeremy was making. We all want to destroy ISIS. But the resources to do it, we're not prepared to do. We all want to destroy. Who, who wants the Taliban to win in Afghanistan? Raise your hand. OK, who wants to deploy the resources to win that fight against the, the Taliban that we started in but, but 2001? Mike, There's a difference Mike, between what we want objectively and what we're willing Mike, to do. Mike, ISIS is not the Taliban. It, is not, it, it doesn't live off the land in the way the Taliban does. They are not, the Taliban, people will tell you, my cousin's in the Taliban in Afghanistan. Okay, ISIS is a foreign occupying force in the middle of the Middle East that is brutal. These people were so brutal, Al-Qaeda expelled them, right? <laughs> so you know, I, think, I think probably you can get some agreement to try to get rid of them. Jeremy, do you want to have thought, and then we'll only get, unfortunately, have time for a final question. So. Jeremy. So, so the one addition to this exchange, I think, just brings us back to the point that Condi was making about how long it takes to bring about the transformation in institutions that's actually required to give us stability, whether it's in Iraq or Syria or anywhere in the Middle East. And you know, the challenge in Syria and Iraq, because I've been in these meetings where the options are laid out and, and sort of people are making these choices, the president included, is that there's broad agreement that we need a ground force. It won't be an American ground force, whether it's to take back Iraqi cities or to take back Raqqa in Syria. The challenge is, who's in that ground force? And what we experienced when Mosul fell and as ISIL made its advance on Baghdad was the total collapse of an Iraqi military that we had invested billions of dollars in creating. We know how to equip, we know how to train, we know how to create headquarters uh, structures and intel structures. But when all was said and done, it wasn't a military that was prepared to fight for the Iraqi state. And so ultimately, our challenge is a slight disconnect between, again, the means that we need on the ground, whether it's in Syria and Iraq, and the timeline for getting those means, a capable and effective fighting force, whether it's in Iraq that's invested in the state that isn't a set of Shia militias backed by Iran that, that sort of tweak all of the concerns of the Sunni populations that have been marginalized. And of course, our challenge in Syria is that the ground force that we needed was the ground force that was challenging Assad in 2011. The ground force that we have now or could potentially partner with includes a whole set of organizations that are funded from outsiders, 
with disparate agendas, and most of them don't care that much about ISIS. What they care about is the barrel bombs from Assad. They care about the chemical weapons used by Assad. And so we found ourselves in a fundamentally difficult position whereby figuring out how to mesh our capabilities with the partners that we need on, ground, on the ground has a real disconnect because of the timelines that you're absolutely right. Yeah. We need to be patient. For. You're, but you, you're absolutely right, Jeremy. But we all know, too, that there are no perfect solutions to any of these problems. And so you can, you know, our job as academics is to analyze and analyze and analyze. Policymakers actually then have to do something. And we've all been in positions where we were in policy positions, and now you have to do something. And yes, the Iraqi forces are not the Iraqi forces that we thought we had trained. But again, they did succeed in one small way in taking Ramadi. Build on that. It may take time. You know, if somebody had said, uh, the Russians have lost World War II because they nearly fell back to Moscow in 1941, you'd have said, yeah, they did. But ultimately, actually, they got their act together and they won it. And so I think this is, a, this is a matter of investing in what you have. We don't have the perfect solution, but you have to invest in what you have. And to make the argument to, to support it. I mean, yeah, what, I, absolutely. what I think, you know, I think we're in a period of retrenchment in America right now. And I think it started with President Obama, right? What did he promise? He promised to get us out of two wars. And he won that election in terms of the debate that we're talking about on that. I don't see a lot of people, I haven't, seen the results tonight, but I, I have a feeling of who won. I don't see a lot of people making the argument the way we're making the argument. And that, that's what worries me. That, the idea that this is going to be simple, that we're going to solve it. Yeah. I mean, Afghanistan has been a long time yeah. with some pretty meager results. Yeah. Uh, so. so how do you make the case to the American people for the long haul part? And, and, and second, to get to what Condi was talking about earlier, about the, we're, we're, we've been focused on the military piece, but the real fight is about the, the, the ideological fight, the hearts and minds piece. How do you make the case to the American people to be re-engaged in that? We got work to do as a country, and by the way, we got work to do in our country to help make those arguments. Yeah, and I, I hope to be able to get to that other component about, especially now that we're in Silicon Valley and talking about how we combat that. But unfortunately, we are just about out of time. But there were a lot of questions. We, by the way, we modeled open exchange here. This is what this was. I would have gotten more. This is the kind of dialogue I don't think we're seeing enough, perhaps, in the political campaign. But there were several questions from students, and maybe you guys could just briefly, in a word or two, who, want to, who are asking, what do I do if I want to be involved in international affairs, in diplomacy? What's the one thing I can do while I'm here at Stanford to equip me to do that? Maybe just some brief run recommendation to leave the students here with. So, so two quick reactions to that. Number one, know something about something. One of the interesting <laughs> things, I think, about the three of us sitting on this stage, all of whom are professors who found our way into government, is that we had our origins as scholars of comparative politics, Sorry. which is interesting, not as scholars of international relations, but ultimately, you know, each of us invested in getting to know places and understanding personalities and understanding processes and institutions. And I think that is less true in this day and age, whether it's at Stanford or whether in our government, that we invest in that kind of knowledge and capability. But absolutely, when you're making policy decisions at the table, uh, people who understand these places, who understand the political personalities, who are able to think through the dynamics of a particular policy choice as it might be refracted through a particular context, those are the people whose voices are second to none around the table. And so use your time at Stanford to know something about the places uh, that you really care about in the world. And then the second is don't write off government. I think there's a tendency in this part of the country, having just moved back a couple months ago, to see government as what's wrong, uh, to see government as standing in the way of solving any problem, to see government as the thing that needs to be disrupted. But part of the reason that I went to government twice over the last six years is government is one of the most powerful instruments for affecting the outcomes that everyone in this room cares about in the world if we can attract the right people to it and energize people around it. I lived right before, during one of my two years at, at the UN, the response to the Ebola epidemic. And I can tell you that the level of fear and demonization and sort of non-science-based political responses rivals what we've seen on the sort of refugee response. But the US government mobilized its capabilities and enlisted the world in stopping an epidemic 
that could have been hundreds of thousands of people instead of 10,000 people. That's something that government can do. And there are lots of things like that. And I think people need to expose themselves to those possibilities to know that this is an option for having an impact. So two quick things. Jeremy said you need to know something. I think the challenge for our university is to help you know something, OK? Uh, which is to say, I think we, we as professors, I as the director of FSI, our Department of Political Science, and we as Stanford University have a role to play in this. Uh, you can't take a course on Russian politics at Stanford University right now. Hmm. Yeah. You and I yeah, are teaching teach one. It. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'll bet you you can't take a class on Syrian politics. Well, actually, there's a few. And in, in other words, we need, there, we need to get into uh, preparing you to do these things in a, in a more uh, robust way. And if you have ideas on that, be in touch with me, because I'm, I'm quite focused on this. We, we need to create the idea that you can do these things and go to government, and not just try to solve the world's problems by you know, developing an app down the street. Because I, I firmly believe the second thing, which is uh, to, to just echo what Jeremy said. I met some incredibly fantastic Stanford students when I worked in the government, both at the White House and out in the Moscow. The tragedy was there were just too few of them. It was shocking how, compared to other universities, how we are just underrepresented in the government. And we got to do a better job of, of showing you the, the way you can make an impact, just like the story that Jeremy just said. Uh, but I also want you to think about it in terms of career choices. There was nothing greater uh, in terms of just sometimes I would get goose pimples when I would stand in front of Russians with the American flag behind me representing the United States of America. By the way, being an ambassador is also a cool job, like Herbie <laughs> Hancock comes to your house and performs, so if you get the job to be ambassador, do it. <laughs> but that, that experience, even if you don't get anything done, to be part of the team, Paul, <laughs> no, seriously. There, you know, we academics, we sit in front of our computers by ourselves. It's a lonely enterprise sometimes. Being on the team called the United States of America, called the U.S. government, and representing our fantastic country abroad was the most fantastic experience I've ever had so far professionally. And I'm, I'm a professor at Stanford University. That's a great <laughs> job. And yet, I really want to encourage you to think about it. And I think it's our responsibility to help you think about it and help you do it. Yeah. Condi, final word? Uh, yeah, I just make two points. One is um, sometimes the way into international relations in a really compelling and personal way is to have a cause. Now, figure out what you care about in the international system. Do you care about refugees? Do you care about human trafficking? Do you care about the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue? But then, recognize that these are actually really complex issues. And so you may have strong opinions. You might also not be right. And so spend time with people who actually don't agree with you. One of the worst things about our system of getting knowledge these days is I can go to my aggregator, my cable news channel, my bloggers, and I never encounter anybody who thinks differently. And you know what happens when you don't encounter people who think differently and then you meet one? You think they're either venal or stupid. Right? So make sure that when you take your cause, you actually know something about it. Facts matter. And secondly, that you actually take the time to hone your opinions by debating them with people who think differently. Don't vilify them. They may just think differently. The second thing is a really very practical thing. Um, you know, learning languages, taking courses, all of that's a really important part of the fabric. But it's also great to have experiences that are international. So study abroad. Uh, spend some time uh, a in a summer working for a non-governmental organization in Botswana or in Peru. Or, because there is nothing like being in another culture and being in another environment. And oh, by the way, if you speak the language too, that's a really extraordinary experience. I think we've all had the experience where for, for Mike and me, you know, where you've uttered something in your third year Russian and somebody actually said something back and you thought, oh, wow, that's really something <laughs> because they actually understood me. It's, a great, it's great to study it in the classroom, know your facts, but it's also great to experience it. And Stanford gives you a lot of opportunities to experience it. Go experience it. 
It's a good note to end on. I apologize that we ran over time. I apologize to those who may have gotten cut off from the live stream. Uh, but this is the first of what I think will be many conversations on these foreign policy issues. We couldn't get to it all tonight, but please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.